what day? It's Saturday night. And we're here at church. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. I don't know about you, but there's nowhere else I'd rather be. I'm, I was just thinking about that as I was driving over here tonight, and I thought of a verse in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. It says, that the people who knew the Lord spoke often to one another about the things of God. And it says, the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written. Does God remember those who care about him and his things? Yes, he, he does. And it says, then it says, the next thing it says is, they shall be mine that day when I make up my jewels. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I don't want to stand up here and talk a long time. Pastor Scotty is ready to go. We've got a great message tonight about the second coming of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask this evening that your spirit would come and be with us. Fill this place with your spirit and your angels. Fill our hearts and guide our minds as we open your word. Thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Chuck, for the prayer, and thank you for the introduction to tonight's topic, Revelation's Second Coming of Jesus Christ, Part 2. Last night, if you were with us, we talked about the first coming of Christ. And as we go through tonight, and to specifically tomorrow night when we complete this three-part subject, you're going to see a big picture of Jesus' coming. The first time he came as a what? A baby. The second time he comes as king of kings and lord of lords. We're going to be talking about that tonight. Now, last night, we looked at several texts pertaining to his coming. We noted last night that Revelation tells us that there are not Revelation. The Old Testament has over 300 prophecies that talk about Jesus coming last night we looked at the, the the whole perspective of his first coming he came as a baby were the people ready for him no according to the bible they were not ready for him could it be that in his second coming that many people will not be ready when Jesus comes. You remember the first, uh, the second night, I think it was, no, the third night, signs of the times, signs of uh, seeing the signs. We talked about how the disciples came to Jesus asking for a sign of his coming. And the first thing out of Jesus' mouth was, don't let anyone do what? Deceive you about his coming. Now, in these last days, I don't want to um, alarm you or to scare you, but there are a lot of deceptions about the coming of Jesus. But tonight, we're going to look we're going to look specifically and strictly at what God's word said, particularly what Jesus says about His own coming. So, the first text that I want to take you to is written by um, Paul, the apostle. In, second, uh, in, in Titus chapter 2, verse number 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to how many men? To all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Why do we need to live such a way? Well, the Apostle Paul continues on to explain in this, looking for the what type of hope? The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice these two things. He said it is the blessed hope. Why is it the blessed hope? It is the hope beyond a world of gloom and doom and destruction and disease and chaos. It is the hope of every Christian. It is what we've looked forward to. It's going to be the grand climax of all things. Paul says, look, the sufferings of this life cannot be compared for what awaits us. Brothers and sisters, we're looking forward to that, to that blessed hope. And then Paul says, it is a glorious appearing. The glorious appearing of whom? 
of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul says it's going to be a glorious event. It's not going to be something that will happen and you'll be wondering, oh, did he come or did he not come? Jesus says over many, many times in the scriptures that he will come again. Uh, I don't have that number exactly, but I do know this that there are over 2,500 predictions that Jesus will come again. We noted last night he came as a baby, right? He came as a baby. He came in the most um, miraculous way or mysterious way, should I say. Titus says, once again, the grace of God has appeared to all men. And he came in the most mysterious way, a baby. I mean... Think about that. A baby? God? A baby? Interesting, right? We saw that last night, how he grew up, how he taught, how he healed the sick. And he told his disciples one day, he says, look, I'm going to go away, but when, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Jesus went away as he said he would go away. He said he would also come again. 2,500 times we have a reference to him coming again. Now that's a lot of times, right? 300 times in the Old Testament tells us that he would come as a baby. But 2,500 times he tells us or we are told in Scripture that he will return a second time. Now, it's interesting that Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, concerning his own, his own self, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in whom? In me, Christ says. In my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for whom? For you. I want you to say this with me. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for me. Say that with me. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for me. You see, when we say me, it is personal. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to, unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Say this with me. Jesus is coming again to get me. Say it again. Jesus is coming again to get me. Oh, don't you just love that? You see, he's a personal Savior. He's coming for you. He's coming for me. I love that. Acts, 10, Acts 1, verse 10 through 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus, I love that, this same Jesus, this Jesus that died, this Jesus that rose again, this same Jesus that you see go away is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And when the Greek says in like manner, that means exactly the way you see him go away, he will come again. And let me ask you a question. Did Jesus go away with nail-pierced hands? Oh, let me give you the narrative. So the disciples were locked up in a room, fearing for their own lives. They were afraid that the Jews and all the religious leaders at that time who put Jesus to death were going to come and arrest them and have them executed too. So they're hidden in the upper room there, somewhere there in Jerusalem. And Jesus comes through into the room, and he stands before them. And one of them, his name is Thomas, who doubted and said, are you the Christ? Jesus says, look, Thomas, stick your hands right here in my side. See my hands, touch my hands, and see, are, are these not the hands that were nailed for you? And that's when he told Thomas, I go away. He told Thomas, if, 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 he told them, if you believe in me, believe also me. For in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. The reason why the disciples did not have to be troubled is because they had this hope, this blessed hope that Jesus would not leave them in this world. Even if they should die, he will come again and receive them unto himself. And that's why we don't have to walk around gloom and doom. Because we know Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? And so 
the Luke who wrote the book of Acts, he's saying, look, the, the same Jesus that went away, he's coming again. By the way, when Jesus took the disciples out there by a hill called Bethany, before he was ascended up into heaven, he said, look, I, you're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. You're going to speak with new tongues and you're going to be able to cast out devils and, and all of this. Understanding this, that when Jesus is speaking here, he has not yet went to heaven. And how long was he on the earth? He was seen for 40 days, walking on the earth, before he ever went back to his Father. That's very important to understanding this topic tonight. This same Jesus will come again. Don't you just love the promise of Scripture? Now, some years ago, I was doing a series of meetings, and there was a gentleman who heard me speaking and he says um, he wanted to talk to me so I went and visited with him in his home he was like you said that Jesus is coming a second time I said yeah correct he said there's nowhere in the Bible that says Jesus is coming a second time he's already come I said when did he come I I'm still here he said oh he came when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and I'm like but yeah, uh, that's been over 2,000 years ago. And I wasn't born then, but the Bible says he's coming back for me. Oh, he says that's a spiritual coming. And I'm like, um, man, that's, that's one I've never heard of. And I found this verse. He said, nowhere in the Bible can you find one verse that says Jesus is coming a second time. Oh, I already knew this verse. And so I just wanted to say, oh, yeah, you're saying there's no verse. Let me go to the verse. Look, I'm going to stick my head out there tonight. And you can, my grandmother raised us up saying, kiva, not cover. She'd come check on us at night. And she'd ha we lived in an old house. I mean, <laughs> we'd have 10 quilts on us, it seemed like. And you could turn your head, but you couldn't turn your body. And so she'd come check, us on, check on us late at night around 1030 just to make sure we were okay. And she said, boys, you got your kiva on? Yeah, Granny, we got it on. Okay, good night. I love you. You can search from kiva to kiva of this Bible, and you will only find one verse that says Jesus is coming the second time. However, don't let me lose you, the emphasis is there. Such as, Jesus says, if I go away, I will come again. Well, he came the first time as a what? Say it with me. As a baby. He grew up. He died. He resurrected. And he says, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. So if he came one time, the second time is when he comes again. So Jesus did say, I will come again. But he never said, I will come a second time. We know it's the second time because he came the first time. As a baby, he grew up, he died, he resurrected, and now he's back with his father, and he's been there all alone. But he's coming again. Now, Paul, talking about this great blessed hope, he mentions the only one who mentions it. Here's what he says. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Where was he offered at? On the cross, right? And to them that look for him shall he appear when? Oh, there it is, my friend. The second time without sin unto salvation, meaning the next time we see him, the next time he comes, he's not coming to be our high priest again. He's not coming to die again. He's coming for those who have accepted him as their Savior. And to them that look for him shall he appear. It's only those that look for him and are ready for him that will go with him in the clouds of glory. Oh, my friend. We've been reading it night after night, and lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He has come to save us, and he is our salvation. Oh, my friends, let's go to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 6, reading this interesting topic, or this verse about this topic, the sign of the second coming. What will it be like? Oh, my friends, look what Revelation, chapter 6, verse 12 says. John in vision says, I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was what? A great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, 
And the moon became like blood. We talked about signs of the times the other night. How earthquakes are increasing. And, and the different magnitudes of earthquakes that we have witnessed in our time. Oh, my friends, there is not an earthquake ever like this one here that is about to take place when Jesus comes. He says, it was a great earthquake, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as fig drops its late figs when it was a fig tree, drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place the Bible says there's coming a day when Jesus is going to come. There's going to be an earthquake. The sky is going to roll back like a scroll. He says this earthquake is going to be so powerful that the islands and the mountains will move out of its place. Can you imagine? We talked about the other night how one earthquake caused a tsunami there in Japan, and it caused the island of Japan to move eight feet. That's in our time. But yet, there's an earthquake that is coming that is much bigger than that one. An earthquake, a time like we've never seen before. And the scripture goes on, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Revelation tells us, John writing here, says there's coming a day when the earthquake shall come. The earth is going to be peeled like a, 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 a it's going to be like an orange being peeled back, or a banana, if you will. It says every island is going to be moved out of its place. And those who do not have a relationship with Jesus will be crying for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them from the wrath of the one who sits on the throne. This is Jesus coming. This is a picture of Jesus coming. This is a picture for those who do not know Jesus. To him, it is wrath. But for those who love him, it is a glorious appearing. Can somebody say amen? Now, there's nothing wrong with being rich. I know many rich millionaires and billionaires. And I tell you, if it were not for them, some of the work that we do in our churches worldwide would go lacking. The emphasis is not being rich. The emphasis is being rich toward goods of this world and not having God in your life. You can be rich, you can be poor, and still be lost. I heard a songwriter say, said years ago, I'm a poor, poor, rich man. Meaning, I might be poor with this world's goods, but I'm rich because I have the king of kings, blood running in my veins. Can somebody say amen? And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them are your works important we're not saved by our works but our works determine who we are serving and there is coming a time brothers and sisters when God says he's going to send his son and the Bible says in every eye shall see him everyone will give an account whether their deeds are good or whether their deeds are evil and John goes on to say, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a sharp sickle. Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with what type of loud voice? Not a soft voice. Matter of fact, this word loud voice, it doesn't mean loud. This, 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 this verse is alluding to an emphasis. Uh, it's going to be an, an increasing intentional voice crying out for people to come and be saved. An angel came out of the temples crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Jesus is making up his harvest right now. That's why this message is going out right now, because he's making up his harvest. Jesus is coming soon, and I want to be ready. 
is coming. It's going to be grand. It's the blessed hope. But yet, for some, it will be a day of wrath. What happens first at his coming? We're going to look at that tonight extensively. What happens first at Jesus' coming? Well, the Bible has a clear explanation or one of the first things or the first thing that will happen when Jesus comes. Let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Paul says, look, I would not have you to not be informed. Oh, my friends, listen. The purpose of Bible preaching the purpose of sharing the gospel is so that we will be informed. So that we can make an intelligent decision. Paul says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Those who are what? Asleep. Now you're going to see here tonight that when Paul is talking about, or when Jesus is talking about sleep, or when Job is talking about sleep, he's literally talking about those that are not taking a nap, but those who are dead. Now, let me say this before we go any further. It is impossible to talk about Jesus' second coming without talking about this subject, death. Oh, my friends, don't let me lose you. Because this is an important topic tonight, centered around Jesus' coming. There is hope in Christ. Can somebody say amen? Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, during Jesus' time here on earth, there were several groups of people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and a few others. We're going to talk about the Sadducees just for right now for this purpose. Paul writing here was a converted Pharisee. He was one that believed in the ministry of angels. He believed in the resurrection. He believed that there was a God. But the Sadducees, the other group, were one of the most strictest groups also. They did not believe in the ministering of angels. They didn't believe that when you die, there is a resurrection. They believed once you die, it was it. And so Paul is saying, look, he knows his audience. He says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning these people because at that time, Christians are dying and everybody's wondering, what's going to happen? Or, or, or is this it? I mean, Jesus said he's going to come again. You're talking about 20, 30 years after Christ has ascended into heaven and they're wondering what's going to happen when you die. Did not Jesus say, I will go away, I will come again? When is he going to come again? And he has not come in their time. And that's been 2,000 years ago. And Jesus still hasn't come. And he says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not, even as others which have no hope. You see, if we don't believe that when Christians die and Jesus will come again and receive them and resurrect them, we have no hope. If it, all it is is we live in this life and get rich, have houses, have fame, have land, have cars, and that's it, what hope is in that? But there's hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God do what? Bring with him. The Bible says, Paul says, look, those who sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. How is he going to do it? Notice what he says. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Oh, by what? By the word of the Lord. Oh, by the word. The truth is I could walk around with this all night long. But if I don't put my faith in it, what good is it? Oh, Paul says, look, I can say this. Uh, I can say this unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, Paul says, look, we that are alive, we that are remaining here shall not prevent those who are asleep. What Paul is saying here. We shall not go to the Lord before those who sleep in Jesus. Let's see what he's talking about. For the Lord himself shall descend from where? From heaven with what? A shout. With the voice of what? 
the archangel, and with the trump of God. And who will rise first? Will I rise first? If I'm dead. But if I'm standing here right now and Jesus comes right now, will I rise first? No. According to the Bible, Paul says, according to the word of God, which he said, by the word of the Lord, I say this to you. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Oh, the dead have the right to rise first because they died first in the Lord. They received the honor. They received the purple heart. They died in dignity. They died in the faith, so they are resurrected in the faith. Then which we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Where at? In the air. And so shall we. I love this. There are certain things that just stand out to me, and I just have to show it to you. It, it says, so shall we, what? Ever be with the Lord. That right there ought to cause you to say, Hallelujah. Because we're going to ever be with the Lord. He says the dead in Christ. Paul says to sleep, those who are asleep, those who are dead in Christ will do what? Rise first. This will happen at the coming of the Lord. And Paul says, look, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Every funeral that I preach, I have to share this Bible promise that those who die in the Lord, those who sleep in the grave, oh, it's not the end. Oh, my friends, Jesus is coming again. And that person, if they die in the Lord, will be resurrected to life. Some years ago, uh, it's been almost 17 years ago, my wife and I lost our firstborn. She was about to be seven months. She was going into her third trimester. She was seven months pregnant. And um, we were down in Orlando, Florida for vacation. And while there, we, my wife went into premature labor. No stopping. They tried to save our child. They tried to save his life. Um, but unfortunately, he died. And I never forget... I, I, I always, I, I made one request unto the Lord. I said, Lord, when I have my first son, I want to be able to sleep with him the first night. I want to be able to take a, uh, I want to take a nap with him. And um, they did everything they could to save him. And the doctor told us what to look forward. So when they put him in my arms, my wife never got to see it, but I saw it. He breathed his first breath and he took his last breath was his first and his last. And I never forget seeing his little face as I was holding him. And I asked the doctor one thing. I said, can I sleep with him tonight? They let me sleep with my little boy in my arms. And I slept with him all night. I almost lost my wife. Yeah, that was a terrible experience. It was, it was a terrible experience for us. And we made it through that night. The next day, two days later, they told us we could go home. And my wife and I, we got home all the way back to North Carolina, which was like a seven or eight hour drive. And we were just devastated, in shock. We had to funeralize him, and uh, we had a funeral for him and everything. His name was Seth Lakota. And I never forget. My wife and I, we were just sitting in our living room thinking about what we had just experienced. And we just, like I said, we were numb. And all of a sudden, we were looking at some sermons, some messages like what you're hearing tonight, but not in a live setting. We were watching them on a satellite i never forget the minister when he was going across that slide like you're seeing. And it came to this picture. And that minister said this, and I would never forget. He said, some mother out there has lost her child. I want you to know that there's coming a day when the angel of the Lord will take that child back and put him in your arms. 
and you'll be able to see him grow up in heaven. Wow, my wife, my wife still says to the day, that was what gave her more hope than anything. Oh, people came by and brought cakes, said, oh, it's, it's going to be okay. But listen, if you've ever been, if, and I'm sure you have, lost someone that is dear to you, words are not enough. Listen, we can only take hope and the sure promise that Jesus, as he went away, will come again. And those who are sleeping in the grave, they will rise first. What do you say about that? Amen. So, who are the dead in Christ? The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Notice at the coming of the Lord, Paul says this, the dead in Christ rise first. It doesn't say anything about those who die in the, in the devil will be resurrected. It says those who die in whom? Christ. Who are the dead in Christ? I'm glad you asked that question. I heard you out there. Somebody asked that question. Who was it? Don't raise your hand. I know who you are. Who are the dead in Christ? I wonder about that. Who are the dead in Christ? Revelation tells us who it is. 14 verse 13. Blessed are the dead which do what? Die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Uh, here's who the dead in Christ are. Those who follow the Lord. Those who put their hope in the Lord. Those who accept this promise, if I go away, I will come again. Those who die in that hope are resurrected. Amen. And if you're living today and you have your hope in Christ and you have made your relationship with him assured, then if you should die right now, you die in the Lord. And when he comes, you will be resurrected. So says the word of God. Where do, the, the, where do those who die in the Lord rest? I'm glad you asked that question because the Bible doesn't leave us in the dark. So where do they rest? So says the Bible. It says in Job chapter 14, verse 10 through 12, notice what Job says. Now, if you're familiar with Job, when we talk about faith, when we talk about patience, oh, some people says, Lord, that person must have the patience of Job. <laughs> or when it talks about faith, um, Lord, they had the faith of Job. And sometimes we'll say things like, Lord, give us the patience of, or give me the patience of Job, or give me the faith of Job. Job was a man who was acquainted with death, acquainted with sorrow, acquaint, acquainted with loss. And he says this, but man dies and does what? Wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, meaning his life. And where is he? Job says, look, I, 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 I know man, he dies, he wastes away, but where is he? Good question, right? Job even asked the question, where is man when he dies? As the waters fell from the sea and the flood decay and drive up, so man does what? Lies down and he rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Job says a man lies down and he simply goes to sleep. He does not rise again until when? Mm. Let's go on to say this. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave. Job says if a man dies and he goes to the ground or, or he wasteth away, where does he go? Job says, oh, that thou would hide me where at? In the grave, that thou wouldest keep me a secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me, listen to this, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time, and remember me, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Oh, my friends, Job says, look, if, 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 if I die, the grave is my home. But there is a set time for me, a appointed set time, that when Jesus shall give a shout, oh, uh, uh, there's a time that he will give a shout and I will rise again. But for now, I wait until my change come. What change? 
I can tell you what change I'm looking forward to. No back pain. No headache. No foot pain. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. I will wait till my change come. But Job says in Job 17 verse 13, If I wait, the grave is mine house. So where do the dead or where do those die in the Lord? Where do they rest? Or even the wicked, where do they go? The same principle is to the wicked. Where do they rest? They rest where at? In the grave or in the mausoleum, wherever they are deposited in this world. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall live again. Job says, I will wait till my time comes. I will wait. I will wait. Jesus told Mary and Martha there as their son Lazarus was dead for how many days? For four days. We see this story of Lazarus. And this story to me gives one of the most beautiful pictures of what will happen when Jesus comes again. Can somebody say amen? We find in John chapter 11, verse 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. When will the resurrection take place? At the second coming of Jesus, right? Jesus says, I go away, I come again and receive you unto myself. Paul says, look, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a voice of an archangel, with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Martha says, I hear you clearly, Lord. I know he will rise again at the last day. Martha knew and understood that the dead will rise again when? At the second coming of Christ. But she didn't realize that the one standing in front of her had keys over death, hell, and the grave. He says to her, Martha, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live again. Hallelujah. Oh, my friends, Jesus demonstrated something. He just wanted to prove it. He says, where have you laid him? Show me where you have laid him. And he gives them instructions. Go, move the stone. Jesus could have moved the stone. But again, kings don't move stones. Other people do it. We've all heard of this miraculous story. Jesus says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then the disciples says, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Apparently, the disciples knew when you get sick, it's important to take rest. Even the doctors tell you when you get sick, make sure you get plenty of rest. We heard that during COVID, right? Make sure you get plenty of rest. And the disciples says, Lord, if he's sick, and if he's asleep, he'll get well. Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then said the disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his what? Jesus says death, sleep is death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? Dead. Now I like that. John says Jesus said plainly. Sometimes the Lord needs to speak to us plainly. And brothers and sisters, what I'm sharing with you tonight is plain. The only thing is, the Bible is plain. It's just that people make it confusing. And if we look at tonight, we'll walk out of here and say, you know what? I don't have to walk around with my head down concerning the coming of our Lord. Or concerning my loved one. Or fearing what will happen to me if I should die. The Bible gives us hope. The same hope that Lazarus was resurrected with. That same hope applies to us today. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave for how many days? Four days already. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if, if, if thou would just have been here, my brother would not have died. Do you think she's telling the truth there? Yes. No one ever died in the presence of Jesus. It was only when they were not in the presence of Jesus when they died. But when he showed up, oh, he resurrected. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. 
And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice. He said, Lazarus, come down from heaven. Follow me. He says, Lazarus, come down from paradise. Follow me. Lazarus, come where? Forth. Meaning, Lazarus was in the grave. Lazarus was in the tomb, and he cried with a voice, loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Someone said many years ago that Jesus called Lazarus by name, because if he would have just said, come forth, everybody would have come up out of the grave. But there could have been more Lazarus, too. Just Jesus specifically said, Lazarus, come forth. And I can imagine there would have been CNN reporters, Fox News reporters, every news agency in the world would have come to Lazarus and said, Now, Lazarus, when you died, how was it? Tell me what it was like. And I can hear Lazarus, what do you mean? I don't have anything to tell you because I was asleep. <laughs> I don't know. My son, two weeks ago, they had to put him asleep to do some procedure in his ear. And I asked him what was it like. He says, Daddy, I, don't, I was asleep. He says, it was, I don't know. And I'm like, and I'm hearing that that's the best sleep. How many of you have ever put, been put to sleep? And you woke up and said, man, I remember it, the whole procedure. No, right? Someone said, it's like, you don't know what happened. And by the way, you're not lethargic. I took a nap this afternoon and I woke up, man, I felt like I was, I didn't know where I was at. I was out of, I was just lost. But I'm hearing that when they put you to sleep, you remember everything before, but you don't, remember, you don't remember anything or you don't know about anything that happened during the procedure. I don't want to be put to sleep, but if it's like that, I do want to be put to sleep. Did you get that? Okay, the Acts of the Apostles, it says this, And men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Now, the book of Acts is, is talking about Jesus, this great hope. Jesus has gone away, and by the way, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost in reference to David. And he uses David as his source. And he's proving that this same Jesus that you crucified is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is going to come again. And he talks about David, and everybody knew of King David. They talked about this kingdom, or this king who was a, a good king, well, by the way, he did some bad things, but he repented. But the lasting kingdom, the kingdom, when they refer to good kings, when the Bible refers to good kings, David is the one that is referred to. And so every Jewish lad would have been familiar with the kingship of David. And, and just in case you're wondering if David has some, some, some uh, rights to heaven and others don't, he says, let me speak freely of David unto you. That he is both dead and he's buried and his sepulchre is with us even unto this day. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith unto himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. According to the Bible verse here, where's David at? He's in the grave. Now, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart, but yet the Bible says that David is in the grave. He's waiting for the resurrection of the Lord. He is considered the dead in Christ. Those who die in the Lord, their works do follow after them. And David's work is still, we're still quoting Psalms 27, Psalms 23. Psalms 119, Psalms 91. David's works are following. We read the Psalms today, and it gives us so much hope. David himself is not in heaven. He's resting in the grave. And what happens at the moment of death? I'm glad you asked that question. Who asked that question? I asked that question. What happens at the moment of death? This is all pertaining to the coming of Christ. Because he is the only one has the solution to death, hell, and the grave. So what happens? Let's talk about that. Psalms, oh, we're quoting from David. Psalms 146, verse 4. His breath goeth forth, meaning man's breath. He returns to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. 
According to the Bible's verse here, when man dies, his breath goes where? Goes forth. Now, who gave the breath? We're going to look at a verse here shortly and see where that breath come from. Who gave breath? God gave breath, right? Genesis chapter 2, verse 27. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a what? A living soul. So his breath goes forth. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Have you ever wondered what happens to someone when they die? Are they able to come back? Are they able to think about how I'm doing here on earth? What says the word of God? The very day that man dies, his breath goes where? Forth. And his thoughts do what? Continue on. They perish. For the living know that they shall do what? Die. But the dead know what? Not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them continues on. No, is what? Forgotten. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. When one dies, it's over. That's why it's important to be ready now. So that if Jesus does not come in the next five minutes, but yet I die, it is best that I be ready when Jesus comes. When I die, I want to be ready. I don't want to wait and try to be ready. It'll be too late. Their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. For there is no work, nor device, no iPhones in the grave. No Facebook in the grave. No Instagram, no Twitter, no, none of that in the grave. I have never conducted a funeral when I heard someone's cell phone go off in their pocket in their casket. Never. It stops. I'm being hilarious with you, but I'm being real too. It stops. There is no knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. I've never seen one break out their checkbook and write a check in the grave or in the casket. No, it's over. And by the way, I can't tell you how many funerals I have done in 25 years. But 90% of the funerals that I do all ugliness comes out during funerals. And it's never the dead person. It's the family members. It, 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 during funerals, it should be the time when we should be coming together. But I tell you, you want to see some chaos? Let it be at a funeral. It, it's at funerals. That doesn't happen here, but I know other places where it happens. Um, yeah. So it, 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 this is the time we need to let our loved ones rest and honor them for the life that they live. Then shall the dust, now here's my favorite verse concerning what happens. And I think it's one of the most clearest subjects tonight. This verse right here. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Now I hear a lot of people say this, and they say, well, I understand that when you die, you rest in the grave. The body goes back to the grave, but that spirit, the soul goes on into heaven. There is no verse in the Bible that says your soul goes off into heaven. The Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall do what? Die. It doesn't say it goes off and lives. In fact, Genesis says that when God created man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I want you to understand, follow me. God didn't put a soul in man. What did he put in man? Breath. Then man became a living soul. Difference. Didn't put a soul in man. Man became a soul. Hold your thought there. So let's understand this. So when man dies, what is it that goes back to God, saith the word of God? The spirit. But what is the spirit? Is the spirit the soul of man? Let's see what the Bible says. Notice, let's read it again. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit return unto God who gave it. Job says, 27 verse 3, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my what? 
nostrils. So Job says when man dies, when man dies, the grave is his house. The spirit that goes forth is the very breath that God put into the nostrils of man. You see what I'm putting, you see what I'm showing you here? It's not that a soul goes flying off into the universe and there are spirit beings in heaven. No, the Bible says the dead in Christ will be resurrected. You will receive a new body. You're not going to be some wandering spirit in heaven. You're going to be a literal person. It is the breath that God put into man's nostrils that returns back to God and the dust returns to the earth. And now the question is, well, where's the soul? Let's look at how God made man. Genesis 2, verse 27. Oh, I should have warned you. This is one of the longest presentations because I'm covering, you're going to see tonight, I'm covering actually three topics in one. And I designed it that way because I knew we had a limited time, amount of time to do this. But the point is I'm trying to make here is I want you to know that you are wonderfully made by God. And when he comes back, he's coming back for you personally. He took time to make you. And I like this. Well, I heard one gentleman say one time that God knelt down in the dust of the ground with divine holy fingertips, touched the dirt of this earth, formed man and he took his holy lips put them on the dirty nostrils of man and he breathed into his nostrils holy breath into a dirty human being or not a human being a dirty thing and man became a beautiful living soul how much does he love you so much that he would bend his knees so much that he would get his fingers dirty. So much that he would kiss your dirty lips. Oh, my friends, if we could ever understand the wise, omnipotent power of God to create. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He whew, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Do you get it? So let me ask you a question. If man dies and goes to the ground, the spirit or the breath returns back to God, where is the soul? Not a trick question. It's easy. It does not exist anymore. Why? The living soul is the result of breath and dirt. Dirt, breath equals living soul. Breath, let's do it in the opposite. Body goes to the ground. No, the breath goes back to God. God. In other words, God doesn't breathe this time. He inhales. He takes the breath of every person that dies. That breath came from whom? God. You think God wastes his breath? Now, for some people who die without Christ, it's going to be wasted breath. All they did was their breath was to drink, to smoke, to steal, to kill, to cheat to blaspheme, and to them it's wasting God's breath, but he still is God. He's still creator. And when they die, that breath goes back to him. In other words, when man dies, he just says, takes the breath back at the funeral. We put the body in the ground. When Jesus comes, he's going to put breath back into the body. He's going to change the body, and they'll be changed forever. But when the breath goes back to God and the body goes back to the ground, no living soul anymore. They don't exist. I got to give you this illustration. I hadn't planned to do it, but I got to give you this illustration. And I started to do this, but I says, no, I won't have time. I started to bring me four boards and some screws. But I want you to use this. I want you to think with me for one moment. Just use your illustration or use your uh, uh, illustrative mind. I'm going to put four boards in front of you, okay? Board one, board two, board three, board four. I'm going to put uh, screws in the boards, and we're going to make a box. You got the box. You already got the box, right? You got the boards, you got the screws, and you have the box, okay? How many sides to a box? Four sides, okay? So let's say God formed man. He put the boards together. He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. He put the screws in the boards. 
Then man became a living soul. Four boards, four screws equals a box. You follow me? You with me? Now, let's take the screws out of the boards. You take the screws out, uh, screws out. What happens to the boards? They fall. Where's the box? It doesn't exist anymore. Why? It took boards, screws to make a box. It took body, breath to make a living soul. You follow me? The soul is none other than the existence of breath and the body. You take the breath out of the body, you, the spirit goes back, the breath goes back to God. It doesn't exist anymore. Simple and plain. So they rest in the grave. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which those that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus is telling us, this is Jesus, by the way, saying this, there's coming a day when all that are in the grave shall hear whose voice? Jesus' voice. Oh, my friends, to those who hear his voice, those that have done good, it will be to them a resurrection of life. But those who do not the will of God, those who have wasted his breath, it will be the resurrection of what? Damnation. So according to this Bible verse, how many resurrections are there? Or what, how many types of resurrections are there? Two. Resurrection, say it with me, resurrection of life, resurrection of damnation. The point is, when will they take place? Well, according to the Bible verse we read earlier, that when Jesus comes, what type of resurrection will happen then? The resurrection of life. What about the resurrection of damnation? Come back tomorrow night. I don't tell you tonight. It's too long. I'll keep you here another hour. You don't want that. You won't get good sleep tonight. Is that okay? You want to go another hour? No. No. Uh, I'll give you a break. i got to give myself a break, okay? So Jesus says, look, there's coming a day when the resurrection of life will take place. Oh, my friends, only happy faces. Children will be given back to their mothers. Oh, my friends, I'm looking forward to that day when I will see my little Seth grow up in heaven. Oh, my friends, I look forward to that day. But meanwhile, what will happen to the lost? What will happen to those people? The Bible says there will be a resurrection of damnation. What will happen to the lost people? Well, the Bible doesn't leave us in dark. It says this. And to you, Paul says, to, who are, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with what type of destruction? everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marred in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Paul says the purpose of me preaching is this so that you might believe the testimony of what I've shared with you about Jesus. He went away, he's coming again. And when he comes, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And they that are alive shall be called up to be with them in the air. But for those who are not in Christ, the wicked, those who do not believe the word of God, the Bible says they will be struck dead by the brightness of his coming. They will be destroyed from the presence of God. They will be destroyed by the presence of angels. They will receive everlasting destruction. That's what the Bible says. And this is all happening at what time? The second coming of Christ. So here it is. When Jesus comes, there's going to be a group that's going to be resurrected out of the grave. The alive, those who are alive in Christ will be resurrected or taken up in the clouds. At the same time, there are going to be people on this earth who are going to be alive. And they're going to be drinking. They're going to be smoking. They're going to be parting it down. They're going to be cussing. They're going to be fighting. They're going to be shooting. They're going to be doing all these things. And the Bible says Jesus will come and catch them unaware. And at that time, they will be struck dead by the brightness of his coming. Oh, this is the undiluted gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the question remains, what about those who've been in the grave that are wicked? Come tomorrow night. And the Bible says, 
Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 through 17, talking about those people that will be here when Jesus comes. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. He who shall be able to stand. I heard some people say, I, many years ago, I heard a gentleman say, oh, we don't read the book of Revelation. Because after Revelation chapter 6, we don't have to worry about it anymore. But notice, Paul, uh, John introduces a question there. Who shall be able to stand? And, and, and when the question mark is there, you don't stop reading. You read to see who will be able to stand. But the many people that have been told that you don't have to read the Revelation, they stop. And no wonder they're confused. No wonder they don't have the answers. No wonder they're walking around like, I don't understand. And they go on this website, and they go on this television program looking for answers only to end up being disappointed. But the Word of God will give you the answers. Can somebody say amen? Who shall be able to stand? Behold, he is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, he says, even so, amen. That word amen means, as it says, it will happen. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the Son of Man be and our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire, a fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. So the Bible says that Jesus, when he comes, it's going to be a literal event. It's going to be visible. It's going to be audible. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be one of the most loudest events. Can you think about this when Jesus comes? First, you're going to hear a trump. And then you're going to hear, you're going to hear the voice of an archangel. And the Bible says the graves are going to be opened up. Around here, I hear a lot of quarries being bombed or, or, or dynamite and all this. Oh, my friends, dynamite has nothing on the presence of Jesus when he comes. It's going to be like one massive popcorn event. Graves are going to be opened up. Who's to say there's not a grave, on the unmarked grave under this church? If Jesus should come right now, the first thing you and I would see is somebody come up through this concrete, through the roof, and up in the clouds, and then next thing you know, we will be taken up. Praise the Lord. That's literally what would happen. Oh, do you feel this the way I feel it? I'm looking forward to Jesus coming. To, I want to preach this so so effectively that you literally feel Jesus coming in the next minute. Get ready. He's coming. Oh, it's going to be a glorious time. Lift up your heads because he is coming soon. Jesus says, if you know all these things, watch. Therefore, for you do not know what the hour is coming when the Lord is going to come. But if you know this, be ready. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were building. They were drinking. They were doing all of these things. They were marrying and giving into marriage. But they knew not the flood until it, they did not know the flood came until it came. Oh, my friends, we do not know the hour. Let me ask you a question, those of you who study the Bible. When Noah went into the, went into the ark, did the flood come immediately? No, how many days later? Seven days. Seven days later. They had been in the ark for seven days. Noah didn't even know when the flood was coming, but he knew it was coming. Listen, I don't know when the coming of Christ is coming, but I do know this. It is on its way. He's coming. Jesus, you're on your way, aren't you? Yes, I am. Tell him I'm coming. He's coming. When, Jesus? I don't even know. But my father's sitting next to me. He knows. And there's coming a day when he's going to give a shout. Son, go get my children. They have suffered long enough. Hallelujah. Oh, that will be the day. That will be glory. That will be glory for me. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and did not know until the flood came in. It took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. 
Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wherever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, as we come to a close, how many of you have ever seen that famous movie, Left Behind? Raise your hand. I, one of the first things I saw in my earlier Christian experience, I'll be honest with you, it, it terrifies me. It does. I remember when I first became a Christian, I was not a minister at the time, and I was curious about end times. I want to know what it's going to be like when Jesus comes. The Antichrist, look, you don't want to miss the Antichrist. When will he come? Oh, there's a whole presentation just for that. But not tonight. We won't talk about that tonight. We're talking about Jesus, the true Christ. And I remember going to, uh, at that time, you would see all kinds of advertisements out there. Bible, uh, let's say, um, road signs, radio advertisements saying, Heaven's gates and hills flames. And I was just curious, and I wanted to go. And let me tell you something. I never really liked scary movies. Right now, oh, it's interesting, we're covering this subject, and I did not literally plan this for to be the week of Halloween. It just happened that way. Maybe God says some people, we really need to sound the alarm. Everything's about ghosts and goblins or, or whatever. How, did I say that right? I don't even know how to say it. Uh, but anyways, I remember these signs that would say, Heaven's gates and hell's flames. And out of curiosity, I wanted to know. I wanted to know about this subject, hell and heaven. So I go to this presentation and lo and behold, it was about the, the coming of Jesus has come. And, and people are wondering, where did my sister go? Where did my daddy go? Where did my mama go? She's a Christian, and she was taken up to heaven. And they're, they're looking around, where did, where did they go? It's like Jesus snuck in the middle of the night, come in, and raptured only the people that were Christians and took them out. And the people who don't know Jesus, they're wondering, where did my loved one go? And they take this literally. Two women shall be grinding together. One shall be taken and the other. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. You know the problem I have with that? People say, oh, there it is. There's going to be a husband and a wife in the bed. One's husband's going to wake up, try to put his arm around his wife. And he's going to put it around a, a pillow. And like, Where did my wife go? And there's her nightgown. She's taken up to heaven. And he's wondering, where did my wife go? He's left behind. And he turns on the news. He turns on the news, and all of a sudden, he turns on the newscast. Said, oh, oh, "Oh, thousands of people have uh, have been taken away, and the graves have been opened up." How did you miss that? Graves are open up. How do you miss that? I don't know. But anyways, the news flash comes across the screen, and the husband all, re all, all of a sudden realizes that my wife is gone. But the problem I find with this is, it says two men shall be in the field. Uh oh, is Jesus promoting homosexuality? Or is Jesus promoting two men in the bed together? No. Let's get real here. What Jesus is using here, he's using something they can relate with. Two men shall be in the field. Everybody knew that in that time, the field representing working in the harvest, working in the field. He says the word of God is the seed and the field is the world. So in other words, Jesus says there's going to be two kinds of people in the last days, sowing truth and sowing falsehood. Oh, there are going to be two women in the bed. Or, or where is it? Let me make sure. It says, um, the one shall be taken and the other left. Um, two men shall be grinding. Two men shall be left in the field. Am I not reading that correctly? But there's another one that says that they're going to be in the bed. Um, you, you, you know where it's at. Go back and look it up. Just in case I'm, you think I'm wrong, go find it. It says, two men shall be in the bed. How many of you read it before? So I know there are some people out there that read it. Do I need to get somebody to search that verse? Somebody find that verse where it says two men shall be in the bed just so I have it for reference. I'm sorry, it should have been there. Two men shall be in the bed. Find that and get it to me at the end of the program. But anyways, make, make a long story short. The field represents the world. The harvest. Two men shall be in the bed. Does that literally mean there are going to be two men lying in the bed when Jesus comes? No, it simply means the bed is a place where you sleep. In other words, there are going to be two people in the grave. Good people, bad people. 
Is that clear? Jesus is using symbolic language, and the disciples hear this. And notice what they ask the question. Where, Lord? How many of you are wondering right now, if one's going to be taken, one's going to be left, where are they going to be left? The disciples are saying, where, Lord? Notice what it said, where, Lord? So the disciples are saying, they hear Jesus say, so when I come, there's going to be one taken and one's going to be left. And the disciples says, but where are they going to be left? And he said unto them, them, wherever the what is, the body is, the eagles will be gathered together. Now, when you see eagles gathering or buzzards in the air or side the road, what's on the ground? The dead person. Jesus is saying to the disciples, when I come, those that are ready will be taken with me. Those will have the opportunity to go with me in heaven. But for those that are not ready, they will be struck dead by the brightness of my coming, and they'll be left for the the birds to devour them. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that it's going to be a secret rapture. Jesus has gone away, and those that are left behind will be left here with three and a half years or seven years to to be saved under the rule of the Antichrist, which many people are teaching. You don't want to miss the topics coming up on the Antichrist, just how real, how active is the Antichrist today. But right now, we're just covering the basics. But the teaching goes like this in the left behind. Jesus comes. Did anybody find the verse? Okay. Our Cox, Sister Cox, tell tell, that it is? Could you read that very loud? You know, I talked to my critics who criticize this. I say, now let's be real. It doesn't say a man and a woman in the bed, so says the movie or the show or the drama. It says two men. Jesus says two men shall be in the bed. But is Jesus promoting homosexuality? No. He's using an illustration to get people's attention. He's nowhere saying there's going to be a time when I come. One's going to be in the bed. Two's going to be in the bed. One's going to be taken. Where did he go? The Bible says every eye is going to do what? See him. There's no good more second guessing about it. Oh, my friends, it's just plain. You see, the Bible is plain. It's just movies and novels confuse it. And by the way, Left Behind is not a factual book. It is a novel. Interesting. Okay. Um, It's going to be like this. The day of resurrection for those who know Jesus. It's going to be a glorious day. For those who don't, it will be a day of destruction. Jesus says, look, (laughs) I'm coming. Would you receive me? And it would be said in that day. I would like us to say this verse together. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him a what? Uh-oh, let's back up. Miss Cox has got it. Um, let's read it again. Behold, this is our God. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him a long time. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Oh, he's coming. You want to be ready? It starts right now. I want to close up these thoughts just so I haven't lost you. Jesus came as a baby, part one. Grew up, taught, said, I'm going to go away. I'm allowing myself to be crucified. He was crucified. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He died, rose again, is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He says, I will come again. He's coming again, and when he comes, those who die in the Lord and those who have ever died in the Lord are resting in the grave. When Jesus comes, he's going to resurrect them, and then we which are alive will be called up to be with him in the clouds forever, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. For those who do not know Jesus, who have been living wicked during this time, and they're alive, they will be dead, struck dead by the brightness of his coming. That's going to be sad. For those who have died wickedly throughout time, they're in the grave. 
notice the Bible up to this point has not said anything about those that are in the grave who are wicked. You won't see that until tomorrow night when we go through the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 20. Don't miss it. Because Revelation chapter 20 completes the whole picture. Oh, hallelujah. God is an awesome God, isn't he? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the promise that you will come again. The promise that as you went away, just as sure as you went away, you will come back in like manner to receive us. Lord, this is a complicated subject. It is because of the confusion that has been created in this world centered around your coming. And that's why Jesus says, don't let anyone deceive you concerning my coming. And the only safeguard against deception is the word of God. The truth spoken in love and in compassion. Tonight, Father, may your message continue to be with us, Lord, and help us to make clarity of this world of darkness so that we can be ready when Jesus comes. We want to be ready. Help us to be so. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. May we all say amen. God bless you. We'll have our drink.